So I'm going to talk about a general framework for building neural networks that respect the underlying uh, physical symmetries. So this is useful. This is, I think, critical for many physics and chemistry applications of neural networks. But I think it's also important for more traditional data analysis type of tasks and computer vision tasks and so on and so on. But today I'm really going to focus on the generic, on the general framework rather than diving very deep into specific applications. Nonetheless, the, as motivation, uh, I want you to bear in mind this classic force field learning problem that uh, uh, this community is certainly very interested in and I've also been working on for a number of years. Uh, at an abstract level, what this consists of is to use whatever training data we have, for example, DFT uh, calculations, to learn to approximate the force on individual atoms and in some kind of molecular system from the positions of its neighbors. So in that sense, it's a classic supervised learning problem. But, the, one, of, but one of the key features of it, somewhat distinguishing it from other machine learning problems, is that there is an underlying symmetry. In this case, it's very simple. The underlying symmetry is the symmetry of rotations. And it's crucial in order to solve the problem efficiently, to learn from a relatively small number of training examples. It's crucial to take that into account. But it's not just that, but also, I mean, here you're dealing with physics. So if you screw up the symmetry, then it's not just that you know, it's going to take a little bit longer, or, or it's going to, you need more training examples. It's going to be slower, a little less accurate. But when you actually use this for something, like use it for molecular dynamics, then it's going to mess up your trajectories completely, even if the symmetry is broken just a little bit. So when you, uh, if you are dealing with recognizing objects, and the, I don't know, dogs and cats, and the upside down cats are not recognized quite as well as the right way up cat, dogs and cats, then maybe that's excusable. On the other hand, if you mess up the conservation of angular momentum or energy, then it's kind of a more serious problem. Okay. So uh, in other respects, however, this whole framework of uh, deep neural networks really lends itself very naturally to this sort of uh, learning problem. In particular, there is a sense, I mean, physics is all about reductionism. And there's a very clear sense on how you would take a large system and reduce it to its parts, and how you discuss or learn the interaction between the parts. So you, in here you have uh, these atomic neighborhoods of different sizes that together make up the entire system. So you have these larger and larger subsets, and those are going to correspond to the neurons in our neural network. And when the neural network learns, then you're going to be propagating information from these individual atoms or smaller neighborhoods to larger ones and larger ones until you have, some, you have learned something about the entire system. So that's good. Now, the other, but the other component, like this kind of the whole you know, multi-scale philosophy, there's kind of compositional structure. It's already inherent in the structure. It's very natural to embed it in neural networks in this way. But the other component is this annoying symmetry, right? So the way a very, uh, like in the first few slides, I just want, to, just want to give an overview to give you a flavor of what's going to come next and so that you can easily slot everything into it. But uh, um, in, at this kind of very mechanistic level, the way that symmetry manifests is that it's going to do something, the, or the action of the group is going to do something to the activations. So if this is one of the neurons in the neural network, which now is kind of a potentially a fairly complicated thing, so it corresponds to the entire part of the molecule or something like that. Anyway, so it has inputs which uh, are all each going to transform according to some, I mean, one, some particular way according to the group. So if you have a rotation, this little g rotation, and you make just one assumption, and you, assumption, you assume that the transformation is linear, then what's going to happen is that this activation is going to become rho of g times the, what it used to be, where rho of g is some operator or some matrix that describes what the rotation actually does to this activation. Now, the same thing happens. Ooh, I have the same. This is the recurring problem, apparently. I might just, ah, uh, OK. So, uh, uh, same thing happens to the second activation, same thing happens to the third activation. And then what we require is that what comes out of the neuron must also transform 
in the same way. So this might be a complicated function of the input, usually a nonlinear function, but it must at least transform in a predictable way. So this is something that's sometimes missed when I give this talk. Like, why, why do I need this? So first of all, we're learning forces, right? And it's a very specific way in which a force transforms when you rotate the system, while the force vector tr transforms with it. But even at the simple level, if we just learn energies, then at the end of the day, you can say, sure, we want to learn a scalar. We want to learn something that's invariant. But inside the network, it makes a lot of sense to have quantities which are not invariant, which do change with the orientation of the coordinate system. Essentially, well, the vast majority of equations in physics have this character, right? So there are, there are vector quantities and uh, matrix quantities and tensor quantities inside the equations, even if the, when you evaluate the entire expression in the equation, you get a scalar. But internally, you have these higher order objects. So this is the sort of thing that happens in these uh, equivariant or covariant neural networks. So the key thing is that things inside the network are allowed to transform. They, are, they do transform, but you need to know how they transform because then at higher levels you can kind of cancel them out in the appropriate way and you finally learn something which is invariant or which just transforms as a simple vector. Okay? All right, so the only assumption that we made here is that th these transformations, when they hit the activations of the neural network, they're linear. And the assertion is that this immediately, like automatically lands us, lands us in this world of, uh, in this wonderful world of uh, representation theory and non-commutative Fourier transforms. Because what happens to many of you, especially those of you who came to our tutorial with Tess uh, last uh, Thursday, this is uh, just, uh, this is the same stuff. This is just revision, but never mind. I need to say it, I think. So, um, what happens when you apply one of these transformations? So you rotate the molecule once, and then you rotate the molecule a second time, right? Then what you've rotated is now going to be rotated according to the matrix coming from the second rotation, and it's going to be the same as if you had applied the rotation corresponding to the product, or the matrix corresponding to the product of the original two rotations, right? So this property that uh, rho of g1 times rho of g2 is rho of g1, g2. This is the defining property of something called a representation in mathematics, a representation of a group. And uh, to everybody's relief, in this talk, we're only going to be dealing with the finite dimensional representations of compact groups. So why is that good? That's good because uh, they have a really canonical th theory. So that's where the power of uh, math comes into bear. I'm just going to use this. Uh, in particular, one thing that happens when you deal with compact groups and finite dimensional representations is that um, there is a kind of chart, the well-known sequence of uh, kind of prototypical representations called the irreducible representations of such groups. And any rep finite dimensional representation can be reduced into a direct sum of these irreducible representations by the appropriate similarity transformation. Okay? So you don't need to know the details of this. That's the whole point that you don't need to know the whole details of this. What this tells you is that to deal with the whole formalism, you only need to know about these irreducible representations. In fact, you don't even need to really know too much about the irreducible representations. You just need to be able to look them up in an appropriate book because anything else will reduce into a direct sum. And so there is some, it's all over the complex numbers because that also makes things simpler. So there is a unitary transformation matrix which gets you into this shape. So that's the motivation for going into, so, and actually, the, the, this transformation, so going into the space of these irreducible representations, that's the analog of Fourier transformation in a group. So the motivation for the whole talk, or for the title of the talk, is to build neural networks which operate in terms of these irreducible representations. And what I'm hoping to impress on you is that this is a good idea because it vastly simplifies everything and allows you to kind of bypass the annoying parts of the math and just deal with the stuff that works really well. Okay? So, uh, Again, so the, this works when you are the, working over C and it's a compact group and you have uh, finite dimensional representations.
So operationally, this actually means something very simple. It means that the activations of a neural network are going to break down according to the irreducible representations. So for example, for the rotation group, the representation, irreducible representations are indexed by an integer, uh, usually called L. So there's the L equals zero and one, two, three dimensional representation. It turns out that the corresponding dimensionality, so the size of these matrices and vectors, is 2L plus one. And then uh, any one activation, which again is like a summary of some part of the molecule, is going to consist of a number of L equals zero components, which I call fragments, so a number of scalars, and some number of L equals one components, and some number of L equals uh, two components, and three components, and so on and so on. So this is the design choice in your neural network to figure out how many of these you want to, uh, want to keep around. And like uh, fancy math notwithstanding, at really at the kind of operational level, all you're going to be doing is you're going to be propagating these matrices. But the thing is that you need to be very careful with what you're allowed to do these ma with these matrices and what you're not allowed to do with the matrices to ensure that you maintain this equivariance or covariance property. I'm going to use these two terms, equivariance and covariance, interchangeably. Okay, so this is a very dangerous slide. <laughs> Uh, my group is not the only group who is looking into this sort of architecture, who came up with the idea of Fourier space neural networks, who came up with the idea of uh, uh, irreducible representations or the rotation group. These things have existed even before uh, three years ago. Uh, this, I just want to list some of the key papers or some of the key, like a subset of the key papers, which uh, are going to, like whose content is somehow going to be like uh, woven into what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, 40 minutes. So uh, one key person is Taco Cohen, who had the foresight that this is going to be extremely important for neural networks, and he's been writing papers on it uh, the longest, and it took him several years until actually papers actually got accepted, but then <laughs> it was like a big turn into a kind of a flood, and uh, it's it kind of almost like a systematic process of charting out the implications of uh, these group theoretic ideas or representation theoretic ideas in neural networks. So we started with just a paper called Group Equivariant Neural Networks. And then there were some uh, a sequence of papers looking at this, especially in the image recognition uh, context. There's a paper called Harmonic Networks by Warhol and all, which also came out actually very early. And then Takuk ex explained how steerability, which is a classic concept in uh, signal processing, actually has a group theoretical interpretation and can be neatly folded into convolutional neural networks. And then there were some more theoretical papers, for example, uh, uh, my paper with Shupendu Trividi, who is a student at U Chicago and DTI, which came out uh, last year. And uh, another kind of very closely related theoretical paper, again by, by Cohen, Geiger, and Weiler. Um, the generalization of this to three dimensional um, steerability, essentially building SE3, so uh, equivariant neural networks, so neural networks which behave appropriately according to both translations and rotations in three dimensions for continuous signals. So that's super important for things like medical imaging. And then the uh, bravest and broadest generalization currently that I'm aware of is again by, by, by Cohen et al. Uh, extending this not just to known groups, but groups, but spaces which locally have this group uh, prop, uh, group uh, structure, or the on which the trans transformations of this locally have this uh, group structure, which uh, he calls gauge equivariant neural network papers. Okay, so now a bit closer to home, and uh, specifically looking at this force field learning problem and the physics type of problems and the klebsch gordon coefficients. Um, Actually, there was a paper in 2018, at least a preprint, which pioneered using many of these techniques, and several of the authors of this are uh, in the room. Uh, of course, uh, Tess Schmidt, who we gave the tutorial with last week, and kind of uh, pretty much at the same time, uh, my group also started looking at these group neural, uh, uh, these Klebsch gordon neural networks. There was a kind of preprint, and now we have a paper out. So it's a kind of joint effort, or not a joint effort, it's a simultaneous effort uh, by multiple groups. And reading any, e e uh, just single papers is not going to give you the total picture, that's for sure. All right, 
Uh, this is the moment to complain if I left out your paper, which I'm sure you have. <laughs> All right. So, um, okay, so the rest of the talk, I want to talk about the following, uh, the following things. I want to talk about convolution and the significance of convolution in general. And then I'm going to talk about how to implement the linear parts of the, what these neurons are trying to do uh, to, uh, to, to guarantee the group equivariance property. Then I'm going to talk about the nonlinear part. Then I'm going to talk about the dirty details. And then I'm going to talk about the specific force field learning architecture or molecular property learning architecture called, called Cormorant that uh, we got into NeurIPS if we have time. All right. So let's talk about, so this, this part is going to like providing some of the context, at least from the machine learning point of view, for what is to follow. So I'm going to talk about convolution. And uh, in talking about convolution, there are two very important characters that uh, must be mentioned. One of them is this, one of them is that. So there's a long history of this subject in our field. And it has been used for various purposes. OK, so convolution. So convolution cla in the classical sense in convolution neural networks really means the standard convolution operation in signal processing. So it means this thing, that you take the imp, the output of the previous layer, so the signal, and you convolve it with a filter or a set of filters. That is, gives the, that is the convolution operation, and that's going to and then you pass it through a nonlinearity that is going to give you the output of your layer that you pass on to the next layer of the neural network. So classical convolutional neural networks really just implement the standard notion of convolution from signal processing. So why does this make sense? Why is this important? So there are two, I think there are two distinct reasons why this is very natural and crucial for uh, uh, high-performing deep neural networks. One of them is that if you think about what these filters are and what they do, is that they are like little templates, right? So, uh, it, and it's also, the convolution operator is like taking a single template and sliding it all over your image or all over the, the output of, or the input of uh, the previous layer. So, you take your template, move it all over the, this F0 layer, and that gives you the output of the F1 layer. And then on the second, the next layer, you take what comes out of the F1 layer, and you take another template and move that template over the output of what came out from uh, F1. Okay. So if you imagine all these filters stacked together, the pyramid that they form, then they really, um, they, they really implement this multi-scale kind of pattern matching system for you, right? That uh, as you go higher up, you're actually picking up information from larger and larger patches of the original image, but you're doing this in this hierarchical fashion where you're not dealing directly with the original image, you're dealing with the features that have been already been picked up at the first layer, the second layer, third layer, and, th and so on. So just by construction, uh, the, um, the, the convolutional neural networks have this multi-scale property uh, which kind of reflects the actual multi-scale property of natural images. Okay? So this is why it, uh, uh, there's lots of evidence that animal brains actually also operate along similar principles. Okay? So the first paper that I mentioned by Cohen and al described uh, this uh, uh, the, this com this combination this uh, co uh, connection between the mathematical ideas, the underlying group theoretical ideas, and what actually happens in uh, classical convolutional neural networks and uh, images. Okay. Now, steerability is a slight twist on this. Okay, it's in a literal sense too. When you're dealing not just with translations, but you're also dealing with what happens when you rotate the image. So that makes things more complicated because. Uh, um, these filters that you use, use usually are directional. So they pick up like vertical uh, gradients, or horizontal boundaries, something like that. So when you rotate, then the same kind of feature is not just going to move to a different position in the image, but it's going to be picked up by a different filter. 
So you need to make sure that for every horizontal edge detector, you have a vertical edge detector, and that they transform correspondingly, and so on and so on. So there's a long history of this in image recognition, steerable filter pyramids. And in fact, what's happening, so when you look at these, what happens to the activations and how the filters uh, must be constructed, it's already a special case of this group equivariant neural network formalism. So in particular, this business that you have, uh, uh, you have horizontal filters and vertical filters, but if you allow rotations by not just multiples of 90 degrees, but by smaller angles as well, then automatically you have filters or you have activations which are going to transform according to the action of the rotation group. So the representations of the rotation group immediately appear, even though it's sometimes not uh, expressed as such. Okay. So you go in all innocent, uh, not wanting to worry about algebra, and just by enforcing uh, the appropriate behavior according to rotations, you are already dealing with the representations of the rotation group. Okay. So this is the, and in fact, this is why this is critical for things like 3D object recognition. So what would really happen in 3D object recognition is that you have, would have this three-dimensional field of neurons, each one of which um, ha has an output which transforms according to irreducible representations of uh, SO3. So this is what uh, some of these papers on SE3 equivalent neural networks talk about. Okay. So in the rest of the talk, I want to uh, relate this to the slightly more general ideas and uh, how this uh, needs to be implemented when you build a neural network for, say, molecules. Okay. So I'm going to make this distinction between first talking about the linear part of the neuron's operation, which, as we've seen, is essentially just a filter, which in the classical case is just convolution with a, uh, with a filter. Here it's going to be the generalization to group, and separately the nonlinear part. Okay. So when we talk about this on a general compact group, then the notation or the formalism changes somewhat. So we're going to be talking about functions which live on some space. Um, actually, the easiest uh, case to imagine is one of rotations and the function living on the sphere. Okay? So the function, you can, whenever I write x, you can just substitute the sphere, essentially. So what, you, what comes into the neuron is some representation of a function on the sphere. And what the neuron wants to do is it wants to do something which is equivariant with respect to the rotation group. So the group is, uh, in that case, the rotation group. And then that group is going to do something to these activations to make this distinction between the group and what the group does, so the group action. I'm going to use T of G for the group action. So every point on the sphere is taken to T of G of uh, x, and what that does is that it drags the function along with it. So the function becomes f dash, where f dash at any point x is what f used to be a tg inverse of x. Okay? So this is how the group acts on these functions. And this is what we want to preserve in via the operation of the neuron. Okay? So these two are going to be the two the slides that uh, present most of the math underlying mathematical formalism. These are the two most mathematical slides in the talk. And the point here is to impress upon you how, the, how clear the analogy between the Euclidean and this more general non-commutative cases. So in Euclidean space, we have a notion of translation. So we have a function, say an image, where you translate uh, the image by an amount t, then that is what happens to it. Okay? Now, you can write down the exact same thing for a group. So you have a function now on the group, so now on the rotation group, or actually any space that the rotation group is acting on. And if you then apply the group actions, so the rotation, then the function changes into that thing. Okay. Now, you've already seen the formula for convolution in the Euclidean case. It's given by that. It doesn't take too much imagination to imagine what the convolution formula is going to be on a group. So all that happens is that instead of x minus y here, we have u v inverse because you know, the v inverse is the analog of minus on a group. right? But otherwise, it's still the same thing. You just integrate over the group. 
of uh, the product of the f two functions that you're taking the convolution of, except one of the functions and argument has been kind of shifted by v inverse, right? So uh, the reason that I started with translation is to it is to uh, uh, to emphasize that this operation, where this comes from, is that it's just the translated version of the original function. Okay, so this is a clear analogy between the term between the Euclidean case and the grouped case. Okay, so. You have this wonderful convolution formula, and you write it down, it's immediately clear that it, this is going to be equivariant. So that means that if you take f and you ap apply the group action, i.e. you translate it, then the convolution is just going to translate. It's a one-liner. And the same thing happens on the group, okay? So you, just by associativity of the group operation, you change the way that these parentheses are arranged, and you find that if you take the convolution formula in the group, and you plug in the transform or the translated version of one of the functions, then the convolution is also going to, uh, also going to uh, translate. Okay. So this is, I think, as this is the moment when I need to talk mo most generally about this notion of equivariance. And uh, literally, it just says that you have, uh, it's like what I said about the neurons, right? That, that neurons have inputs, and if you apply the transformation to the inputs, then what comes out is the same as if you had applied the neuron to the untransformed versions of the functions, and then applied the transformation at the end. So this is what's usually denoted by these uh, commutative diagrams in uh, math, right? So you have uh, a function space. This is, say, the uh, space in which the activations of the neuron live. And you have a notion of, uh, of uh, the group actions. So it's a G acts on it. And actually, it again gives you another activation. So it's still in the same function space. But the other thing that can happen is, but the other thing that happens is what the neuron does. So there is some operation, say phi, which takes the activation and transforms it to the output of the neuron. And this equivariance property just says that these two operations commute. So if you first apply the group operation and then you apply the neuron, that's the same as first applying the neuron and then applying the group operation. Okay. So this is super simple, super kind of this, uh, safe canonical stuff uh, so far. Okay. Now in terms of making this actually work in a reasonable fashion on a computer, the key idea is the this combination of ideas of the representation, um, reduction into irreducibles, and the Fourier transform. So, so this slide is about kind of the math behind the machinery that's required to make the stick. And that's this general machinery of non commutative Fourier transforms. So this is our old friend, the uh, Fourier transform on uh, Euclidean space. And it turns out that that too has a natural generalization to compact groups. And it looks very similar, right? So you have an integral over the group of the function weighted by something. The only difference is that that something that you weight by is not anymore these uh, complex exponentials, but lo and behold, the irreducible representations of the group. Okay? And one simple way to check that this makes sense is that if you think about it, these actually are the irreducible representations of the translation group. So the left-hand side is just a special case of the right-hand side. Anyway, so there's a notion of Fourier transformation on groups. And it's a little bit, it looks similar. It's a little bit weird because it gives you a bunch of matrices, right? Because the rows, these are operators or matrices. So obviously when you integrate them, you still get a matrix. But in other ways, it's very nicely behaved. Okay, so this is just a reminder of what a representation is, what an irreducible representation is. In particular, what's very nice about it is that it obeys the convolution theorem. So the convolution theorem, the classical convolution theorem says, that uh, the Fourier transform of the convolution of two functions f and g is the, is the pointwise product of the Fourier transforms of the two functions. It turns out that this also holds in the group case, except this product is now a matrix product and not a, a pointwise product. Okay? And also, if you just follow the definition, it's also obvious why it uh, just then gives you an even cleaner way of seeing why a convolutional group is going to be equivariant because it just corresponds to multiplying 
f on the left by, or f hat on the left by the corresponding representation matrix. And since if you take a product of matrices and multiply on the left by representation matrix, then you can again put the parentheses this way or that way, it's going to be the same thing. So there's this kind of perfect parallel between the classical world and the and uh, the non uh, and the non commutative world. Okay, so this is where our result from last year comes in, which says that it's not just the case that convolution is convenient because it gives you an equivariant linear operation on any compact group. In fact, any it's the on the only possible uh, equivariant linear operation on a compact group is convolution, and. Uh, uh, you can think about why this might be true. If you are familiar with, uh, I don't know, field theories and so on, and the representation theory, then it pretty quickly becomes clear that if you have an equivariant operation, it's not going to be allowed to mix um, parts of the function coming from different Fourier components, so from different irreducibles. Those are called the isotypic parts. So you know, some part of it is in the L equals zero irreducible part, some of it in L equals one part, and so on. Those are going to have to uh, be transformed separately. So it's a linear transformation which leaves these subspaces invariant. The non-trivial part of the, oper of the theorem is to show that it's not just that, but uh, you know, let's, so let's think about this in terms of the, in terms of, uh, the, just the matrices. So what I just said, so what this says is that any, any if, so, the, so the, the linear operation of the neural network, i.e. the multiplication by the weight matrix usually, mu in Fourier space must take the following form. So it must take, say, well, let's use the same symbol. Let's, so f, so this is the f in at corresponding to one of the L uh, indices, so one of the channels. So that's a matrix. And the only thing that, the only allowable operation that the weights can do to this thing is to multiply this matrix from the right by a weight matrix uh, W. So this is a linear operation. It keeps the different Ls separate. But it's a very specific linear operation because it doesn't mix the columns, right? So this, ma this F matrix has these columns. And the individual columns are also, the spaces corresponding to the individual columns are also invariant, are also preserved by the transformation. So that's the only part which took a little bit of work to uh, convince ourselves of. Okay. All right, so this is the abstract stuff. But what does this mean in practice? Well, I was super general, and I told you that convolution is really an integral over the group. So that's already pretty bad, right? Imagine trying to express a function over the rotation group and trying to do this integral and find and, uh, and uh, uh, the, the quadrature involved and so on and so on, having to do that every single neuron in the neural network. That doesn't sound so good. However, I just told you that in Fourier space, it's just really matrix multiplication. And this is the sort of thing that actually, you know, TensorFlow and PyTorch are pretty good at, right? So all the, and um, essentially what happens is that all the structure complexity of the algebra, in particular the fact that we're in a group, and a specific group, is somehow uh, uh, captured just by these representations. And once you've done the Fourier transform, everything else is just matrix algebra. And you don't need to worry about what group you're on or the special properties of the group and so on and so on. So this is, a, this is where math actually becomes helpful. Yeah. So there are special cases when uh, what, what I kind of uh, uh, skimmed over a little bit is that often this function is not actually a function of the group. It's in a space that the group is acting on. And that induces particular sparsity pattern in these matrices. So that's all that happens. And then you need to worry about how these sparsity patterns combine. But that's at this level, it's kind of just a, a detail. So the message is that the nonlinear operation in Fourier space just becomes matrix multiplication. So you just m multiply with these weight matrices. Okay. All right. So now let's move on to the nonlinear part. So neural net or neurons without a nonlinear operation are not very impressive. And they have this unfortunate property that if you compose them, then you get the same thing. So you're not going to be able to learn much. So that's the other component of building an effective uh, neural network. And typically, the type of 
nonlinearity that people use are you know, something like the sigmoid function or more recently something like the ReLU. And this is something that is definitely equivariant because it's pointwise, right? So you're doing something to the function separately at every point of the function. So this is good. The bad news is that it's really difficult to do a ReLU in Fourier space. That's true in the Euclidean case. It's also true in the, when you're in a group. So some people do that. Uh, it requires back and forth Fourier transforms. The alternative is to try and cook up some kind of nonlinear operation that you actually can do in, uh, in the Fourier space. And the simple one is something like squaring the function. So in the Euclidean case, this is the uh, um, it, it, uh, this, this is what the Fourier transform of the square of a function looks like. In fact, you see, this is an aside, that you see there's a symmetry that uh, the uh, Fourier transform of a convolution was uh, pointwise product. The uh, Fourier transform of pointwise product is convolution in Fourier space. In some generalized sense, this is also true on groups, but it looks a bit more hairy because it's not so clear how to convolve uh, matrices. Okay. So as I said, there are two possible things that you can do here. One of them is to say that, okay, I'm going to use, I'm just going to use a, a fast Fourier transform to go back to, Euclid, to go back to the time domain and do my non-linearity there. So that requires these repeated forward and backward uh, Fourier transforms. So that looks bad, but in fact, there's a separate technology of that. So I'm only mentioning this because I think it's so much fun. It involves taking the group and redu the, in the fundamentally reducing it to this tower of subgroups and building up a Fourier transform on the entire group from Fourier transforms on the subgroups. And that requires relating the reducible representations to each other and relating them in such a way that the transformation from one irreducible to another is sparse and therefore can be executed fast. And if you're systematic enough about it and you spend a couple of uh, decades of your life studying this, then you can achieve Fourier transforms on groups, which look very similar to the classical, say, Cooley Tucky, uh, Tucky uh, Fourier transform in that they run in essentially order n log n time. So this is good, but still it's order n log n for every single neuron. And it requires quadrature on these groups, right? So just to exp you need to constantly re-express your function, say, on the rotation group, and then the Fourier transform, do something with it, and then also re-express it on the Fourier transform on the rotation group. So it's a little bit painful. So I actually prefer the alternative approach, which is this kind of squaring-inspired approach. Except I just told you that you can't really square, square a function easily in Fourier space for a group. There's one thing that you can do, however, and that is you can take tensor products. So this is like, a, uh, this is the pit that you always fall into when you want to try and do something non-trivial in Fourier space uh, uh, corresponding to uh, uh, a compact group. So if you have two representations, then you can uh, do the uh, direct sum and you get a representation. That's not very interesting. It's a linear operation. You can multiply it by a number, blah, 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 it's all the boring stuff. The only kind of non, and not and totally boring thing that you can do is that you can take the tensor product of two irreducible representations, or generally two representations. And I just told you, so, and, 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 and it's very easy to see that the tensor product of two representations is still a representation. I just t told you that for any compact group, any representation breaks down into direct sum of irreducible representations. So this must also break down into direct sum of irreducible representations. You know, God knows how, but somehow it happens. And actually there are ways to figure that out. And this is called the klebsch gordon transform. So if this rings a bell from your studies of quantum mechanics and physics is because yes, this is closely related to how angular, the addition of angular momentum. And the reason is very simple because what you have is that you have quantities that individually transform according to the irreducible representations of the rotation group or SU2, and you put them together into one system and effectively you're taking the tense product of the corresponding spaces and you need to figure out how the decomposes into subspaces corresponding to angular momentum separately. Okay, so this is an operation which uh, is in terms of the irreducible representations of the group and it's non-trivial, but it can still be done. 
And you can also do it with the Fourier components of these functions. So you can take the two Fourier transform, take the tensor product, decompose it, and you get out a bunch of things which, again, transform covariantly. So this is a nonlinear operation, which is also covariant. So in fact, in our neural networks, which we use uh, for these uh, molecular property prediction and uh, force field learning problems, this is what we use. It's a bit of a kind of poor man's nonlinearity because it's just quadratic, and in fact, it's very closely related to just squaring the function. But at least I can do it efficiently and neatly without uh, interpolation on the group and so on and so on. So it's all charted, so you can look it up on Wikipedia. There are these, these uh, Klebsch Gordon coefficients are. Uh, can be computed recursively. You only need to write the, the good news is that you only need to write the routine for it once and then you can uh, use it. And um, so there's all, again, the overall picture is that some amount of fancy math in the background, but the, ultimately the architecture is very simple. So for example, this is the architecture of our neural network that we use for spherical object recognition. So it involves like sticking these matrices together and multiplying them on the right by the weight matrices and doing the klebsch gordon product and doing this repeatedly. So these are all just linear operations, one after the other. Okay, the, the tensor product is, is, uh, is uh, non-linear, but otherwise, these are trivial operations. These are things that are easy to actually realize in existing uh, software as well. All right, so let me transition into the to talking about uh, how this is implemented or how it's going to have to be implemented in software to make it scale. So this is related to what I was, what we were already talking about last week, but only a subset of you were here. And anyway, uh, I <laughs> ran away over time. So that was, and this is also kind of the story of my life because uh, when I entered the field, uh, I thought I was going to be this. And then things changed. So then I realized that machine learning also involves a little bit of this, and also involves a little bit of this. And the three are kind of inseparable at this point. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the latter two parts. So I want this to be implemented in the neural network architecture at the level of, like everything, so that these, these SO3 equivariant objects to be equal citizens to all the matrices and tensors that neural networks love. And in particular, in C++, there's almost this principle that user-defined classes, user-defined types must be on the same level, must have the same efficiency and uh, no more constraints on them than all the built-in types. So if I, I'm to build a neural network for this, then there's just going to be simply classes corresponding to these SO3 equivariant objects. And they're going to work like all the other internal classes of the, of, uh, the language. So for example, you can create these random objects. Uh, you say this is a SO3 vector corresponding to one component for L equals 0, one component for L equals 1, and one component for L equals 2. And this is what it looks like. Okay. And you can also take two of these. You can add them together, or you can take the klebsch gordon product. Uh, it's just a simple operation. All of a sudden, uh, hey, if, hey, this is the result. And then uh, you, but finally, you can build neural networks from it. So you define a little neural network of the forward function. And as usual in all the deep learning software, you can just back propagate. So you can call the function this way. This is going to be the evaluation of the, f of, of the function in the forward direction. But you can also plug in a gradient and, uh, and back propagate from that and see what comes out. And it's going to, hopefully, it's going to be the correct thing. And all the internal weights are going to be updated uh, efficiently. So the reason uh, uh, Patrick already, OK. Uh, last week, Patrick already did a very thorough job of uh, trying to elicit from me an answer of why I'm doing all this. So <laughs> part of the reason is that uh, I want it to be like, neatly packaged inside the language. The other part of the reason is that I, similarly to how uh, the deep learning frameworks caused the revolution in the f field because the computing the gradient was built in, so you couldn't screw it up. I want something similar here because if these types are built in and only operations that you're allowed to make on them are covariant operations, then you don't need to know all the representation theory and you don't need to be very careful about making sure that everything dances together perfectly because there's simply going to be no way of uh, messing it up. And the third 
reason, which is also important, is that this is unfortunately in a different domain than, say, classical convolutional neural networks for image recognition. Because there, you have you start with fairly large images, and large well, the, maybe the filters are small, but the, the activations are also follow this pattern of large er arrays uh, over Euclidean space. So essentially. Uh, you are, um, you can have a fairly abstract, high-level interface in PyTorch. The only thing that you need to worry about is that these elementary linear algebra operations are implemented efficiently on the GPU for large matrices and large tensors. Whereas here, say in molecular dynamics, you're going to have these individual objects flying around, but lots of small objects, which is like the worst possible scenario for parallelization and, in particular, for the GPU. So. Uh, hiding everything and pretending that it's all just a generic tensor might not be s uh, such a good idea. So for example, uh, you need to put a lot of thought into how these things are laid out on the GPU. If you uh, came th Thursday, then I already started uh, talking about this, that uh, on the GPU there are individual streaming multiprocessors, and each one of them launches threads in batches of 32, at least on NVIDIA machines. And the memory is um, laid out in a corresponding way. So there are 32 banks of floats. And if you have multiple threads and they all st try to access the same bank at the same time, then it's like not having any threads at all because they're all going to be waiting on each other. So it's critical, and I learned this the hard way, that if you have these SO3 fragments in your GPU's memory, then they be laid out this way and not that way because this way it's going to be like 30 times faster. So there are all these little details. I think what's more interesting is how you can actually leverage the structure, the algebraic structure of the underlying operations themselves. So the key operation here that was not there in PyTorch and TensorFlow and its friends is the klebsch gordon product, right? So that looks like just a linear transformation. OK, what's the big deal? Well, it has a particular sparsity structure. The, uh, the sparsity structure means that, in some sense, the each row of these matrices only con contains a single non-zero entry. So if you implement that explicitly, you can reduce the order of the computation by one. And uh, there is more. For example, in these networks, you have to do uh, multiple, like products of, uh, of multiple uh, SO3 vectors with each other. It's like this is the second order SO3 uh, or, or klebsch gordon product, right? So all of a sudden, the number of uh, components that comes out uh, starts increasing, and the structure of the computation also starts increasing. So, uh, but it's still, you know, you can say, okay, it's associative operations. So these are the three guys that they're multiplying together. And then it doesn't really matter whether I first multiply this with that and then that with that or the other way around. But from the point of view of a computer, unfortunately, it does matter because the size of these objects is going to be different and the actual, you know, the cache behavior and so on is going to be different. So if you are in the business of doing Klebsch-Gordon, this is what, how you earn your living, doing Klebsch-Gordon transforms, then you worry about how to do this optimally. So you write a little domain-specific language which uh, you can use to figure out what the optimal sequence is and then store that and use that happily ever after. It gets even more interesting when you take the square of something, so the klebsch gordon product of something with itself. So what happens in that case is that you get cancellations. In physics, this is called a selection rule. So if you add an L equals 1 angular momentum with an L equals 1 angular momentum, then in fact, you're either going to get 0 or 2. So this guy falls out. So there's a more general way of seeing this. Uh, and from an algebraic point of view, what happens is that in this case, um, there are two actions now. One of them is the action of the rotation group acting on these, on these uh, vectors from the left. The other is the action of the, of the permutation group, so the symmetric group, just permuting the factors in this product. And the whole operation is still linear, which means that whatever falls out is still going to reflect these two actions. So you're going to have these matrices, and the rows are going to transform according to the irreducible representations of the rotation group, and the columns are going to transform according to the irreducible representations of the permutation group. Now, if the things that you multiply together were all the same, then that means that when you apply the permutation group from the right, 
it's not going to have not going to be able to change anything. So that also means that you take these representations acting from the right, you do, uh, break them down into irreducibles, and when you have a factor which corresponds to a trivial representation, i.e. the representation, the one-dimensional representation which is, doesn't change anything, that's fine. But in every other case, when you apply the permutations over all possible elements of the permutation group, it's going to all cancel out. So there's going to be tons of zeros, and you want to be able to detect that inside your product instead of just computing lots and lots of zeros, or in fact, or linearly dependent components uh, for naught inside your computation. Okay, so this is also going to be part of the part of the deal. This is what makes it, from at least from a mathematical point of view, slightly more uh, <laughs> interesting. Okay. Oh yeah. So, so we also actually got this to work on the classical QM9 and MD17 data sets, and we have respectable results. Of course, it's a moving target. So who knows whether. Uh, how much better other people have gotten since then. In the summer, it looked like we were one of the top contenders or maybe the top, the top contender on, Q, on, uh, on uh, QM9 in terms of all the neural network architectures, other more physical models, whatever, that's a different story. But anyway, it shows that as a neural network, this is pretty competitive. What I like about it more is that it follows the kind of same philosophy as actual physical interactions. So this whole business of building up the model from smaller interactions between subsets and looking at the different, uh, over like the L equals 0, 1, 2 orders and so on, looks very much like the multiple expansion. And that also means that everything inside a neural network is going to have some sort of interpretation in terms of these physical type interactions. So what you get out is not just uh, incidentally respects physics, but also I think is going to be more interpretable. So. What we have, at least what we published, is still a bit too complicated for my taste. There are various sort of funny products and so on flying around here. Turns out that we can remove a lot of them, and we still get a uh, fairly well-performing network. Uh, I want to go back and take this very minimalist approach and dig into like what is the absolute minimum that is required for this to work well in practice, and see if what uh, the neurons do actually then has some kind of physical interpretation. So these are the actual results comparing the Cormorant architectures to the neural message passing type and the scattering type networks and SNET. And this is on MD17. Okay, so let me wrap up. I hope I didn't run too much over time. So these are some of the characters involved. Uh, Brandon was critical in getting Cormorant running. He's now working for Atomwise. He was a physicist. He's a physicist, and, uh, um, and this was really the core of his project over two years. Horace is my PhD student. Son is also my PhD student, but he also he worked more on the on the graph neural network side. Uh, Shupendu uh, um, in the, was involved in the general results, and we co-wrote this paper on uh, uh, equivariant neural networks and convolution in general. And Eric is now working with me as my postdoc and taking over from many of these other uh, contributors uh, on actually getting this to work on physical and chemical systems. Thank you.